Hello, my name is Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to this Vlog 19 and we're exploring academic integrity. This vlog is part of a suite of three. This week I'll explore academic integrity as a phrase, define it and look at a series of practices and behaviours. Next week I'm overtly investigating plagiarism and the PhD. And in the final week of this trilogy I'll explore paraphrasing quotation and the PhD. This is an important week, this one, and once more it comes via request from one of our great students. Hi to Jess. Jess asked me particularly to talk through in these vlogs some of the policy changes that are being enacted to you guys as research higher degrees students. So it's my great pleasure, Jess, to present the first of these and look at academic integrity. And this phrase really does matter. In the last decade in international higher education, you will hear academic integrity discussed over and over again. It is a burgeoning phrase. It is a really important phrase. And there is a reason for that. And to explain why academic integrity is increasingly important, I have to look at the bogeyman. I have to look at the folk devil that it's replacing. And the folk devil is, of course, plagiarism. In terms of international reputational damage, finding plagiarism in a PhD, and it's often found by an international examiner, is one of the worst things that can happen in research higher degree spaces. So a university can be pretty well permanently damaged if an examiner finds plagiarism in a PhD. It is very very serious. So what we have to do, those of us who work in the graduate space have to do, is ensure that you have the skills to enable your research to be excellent, to be original, to be rigorous, to be transparent and to be accountable. But internationally there's a new movement that is enfolding around a plagiarism policy that's positive and proactive. And this suite of policies often goes by the phrase academic integrity. And the wonderful South Australian scholar, she's at the University of South Australia, Tracy Britag, has published the Handbook of Academic Integrity, a wonderful book and I really recommend it to you. But Tracy described academic integrity as, quote, crucial to every element of the educational process, end of quote. Academic integrity is often used in a way that is synonymous with research integrity and also educational integrity. So before we started to see this change in language, we simply used to refer to a plagiarism policy. So up to about 10 years ago, we would be enacting a plagiarism policy on you guys and gals. Now it's much more nuanced than that, and we're looking at academic integrity. So let's put in place some definitions for you. What is academic integrity? Well, it refers to a suite or a portfolio of policies and procedures that enables information literacy, citation practices and high quality referencing. Curtin University, for example, when it refers to its academic integrity policy, it uses words like fairness, excellence, transparency, impact, respect and courage. So these are all very positive words that are pointing us into the direction of academic integrity. It is of course crucial, it is the core of what we do in postgraduate education. Academic freedom is founded on scholars agreeing to both rights but also responsibilities. And historically, the phrase academic integrity started to emerge you know, in the late 19th century when university academics, people like me, would not only be teaching, but also creating original research. And the key word there is original. There is a relationship between academic integrity and research integrity 
academic misconduct and research misconduct. For example, the ARC in Australia focuses on research integrity and research misconduct. The goal is to safeguard confidence in publicly funded research. So it's a belief in refereeing and acknowledging profound transparency and excellence when determining grants and so forth. So when we're dealing with an integrity breach, whether it be academic or research, it is a deviation from the standards that we expect, either in the ARC or in our institution or internationally. So academic misconduct, research misconduct, refers to fabrication, plagiarism, fraud, deception, fabrication of evidence, also a mismanagement of conflict of interest. So if an academic, for example, was to simply hire a mate to examine your PhD, that is research misconduct. Also a failure to either gain or abide by an ethics clearance. Now at Columbia University, often in the United States particularly, academic integrity is handled slightly differently. But if you look at, for example, Columbia University, they focus on academic integrity and link it to a responsible code of conduct. And intriguingly at Columbia, they focus a lot more on the importance of quotation, paraphrasing and citation. So these are key information literacy skills. So right now, and I mean right now, Flinders is transforming its policy in this area. Historically, this university has been focused on academic misconduct. And for research higher degrees students and your supervisors, this is manifested in two separate ways, almost two separate policies. There's a focus on plagiarism that is revealed through the candidature. And secondly, plagiarism that is revealed through the examination process. So while the processes to discover academic misconduct, particularly plagiarism through the examination process, has not changed, the policy and the procedure to explore plagiarism during your candidature has transformed quite radically. So by our older regulations, and you may not have known this, but by the older regulations, any moment and any draft that is exchanged between a candidate and a supervisor could trigger an investigation of a plagiarism breach. So that means, for example, you could send your supervisor a draft, and if you've left off a reference or you've misreferenced something, you could then be charged with alleged academic misconduct, and you will have to move through an academic misconduct procedure simply from sending your supervisor a draft. Did you know that? Probably not. Now, universities around the world got themselves into incredible trouble with this process because what happened was, happened so often, supervisors who didn't particularly like their PhD students and would like to get rid of them cried plagiarism on a minor draft and it was a way to remove that student from their supervision. So as you can see, this gets really, really messy. It is a real threat. I experienced it personally in one of my former universities uh, when I was head of school. I had in my school uh, an unhappy supervisor who cried plagiarism on a student's draft. Now, as the head of school, I had to administer and manage this claim. And the crazy thing was, it was in a PhD and with a PhD student, but I was managing that plagiarism crisis through undergraduate regulations, you can imagine. But we've got to ask ourselves, is the draft that you give to your supervisor accessible work like an undergraduate essay? Question mark. Now, I would argue, no, it is not. But the ambiguity between the draft you give to a supervisor and an undergraduate essay is causing some problem and some challenge around the world. So 
at Flinders University, we have addressed this ambivalence in policy and procedure by transforming our academic integrity suite. And this is happening this year. This is happening right now. So what we're doing is remember there's two parts of this story. There's academic integrity and academic integrity breaches during your candidature and academic integrity and academic integrity breaches through examination. Right? So the processes happening during examination have not really transformed at all. Where we focused our attention is that notion of what happens during your candidature. So we are right now stopping that notion of at any point in the candidature a supervisor can raise a plagiarism claim. So in that weekly draft, we can't any longer claim that is a plagiarism moment. And I really want to thank the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic for his intellectual generosity. He invited me along to this fascinating working group at Flinders to ensure that the research higher degree students, your interests, were actually represented in this meeting. Because you might remember, I've been very focused while I've been Dean to remind our Flinders community that you all are students. Yes, you're very high level students, but you are still students and you are learning. So therefore, I focus very strongly on during the candidature, you are learning information management, information literacy and academic integrity. So what I've done is I've tethered the assessment of academic integrity and plagiarism to your milestones. So once a year, when you put in place your work and your form to talk about your milestone, first year, second year, third year, you'll be presenting work that is tethered to that milestone. And that is the piece of work that's going to be assessed for academic integrity. Now, this is really important. It's completely transparent and it allows you and your supervisor to have very honest and caring intellectual conversations about you learning information literacy throughout the rest of your candidature, knowing that at your milestone, you will be assessed on your academic integrity ability. That will also prepare you for examination. So as you can see, it's now fully transparent. Three times during your candidature, you will be assessed for academic integrity, preparing you for examination, where you will also be assessed for your academic integrity and academic literacy. So this means the weekly drafts that you exchange with your supervisor, that is not part of the policy. You are learning academic literacy through that process. You will be assessed during your milestones. So this is building up the transparency and the accountability that exists in academic integrity at this university. So plagiarism isn't the only part of the academic misconduct suite. Collusion is also part of this story. Collusion is a lot rarer in postgraduate education. What it involves, of course, is people working together during a submission, for a submission, that's meant to be the result of independent work. And the line between collusion and collaboration in undergraduate education is quite messy. But for me, I've always determined the difference between collaboration and collusion on the basis of deceit. So if you have a conversation with somebody and you cite that you've had a conversation with somebody, that's not collusion. That's collaboration. It's when you've had that conversation and you simply mask it or hide it that you haven't had that conversation. And that is collusion. Now, where collusion may have a bearing on you and on the research higher degree space is as follows. In your doctorate, if you have put published work in there, you need to be very, very clear about who has been involved in that work with you. So it's not only a matter of citing other people that might be involved in the work, but also their percentage of involvement in terms of design, data collection, and also the writing, editing, and drafting. Remember, examiners need to know that this is your work. Simply saying, oh, I was first author on it, that's not enough. 
you need to specify the percentage of the work you're enacting through each of those stages. Full transparency, full accountability. So as you can see, the focus on academic integrity rather than academic misconduct or plagiarism or collusion is meant to render this a much more positive suite so we can have this conversation about intellectual generosity and also information literacy. For those of us who are working in doctoral and master's education, we need to make sure that you have all the professional development that you need to be academically rigorous. So that might be you understand software, you've got the EndNote suite, fine, it's working well in your thesis, there's no problems there. Also high levels of writing, but also research ethics, ensuring that methods are well deployed and you talk through the strengths and the weaknesses of those methods. We also talked about, for example, note taking last week. And thank you so much for the wonderful feedback I got on that one. You're a star. But what I would say to you is note taking in some ways is the foundation of academic integrity. So never underestimate it. So information literacy is really part of the professional development programs that we need to deliver to you. And that's why it's important that we're having this conversation. Because a research master's, a PhD, is about high level research skills. But just holding those skills is not enough. You need to perform those skills through your PhD. So the point of academic integrity is to ensure that you are generating an original contribution to knowledge and it can be transferably checked. This is the key. It's not just going, I have an original contribution to knowledge. Your examiners must be able to verify that. They must be able to prove that you have an original contribution to knowledge. And they do that via your ethics clearances, by seeing a clear presentation of your methods, and also checking and verifying your footnotes and your references. Now, all of this seems quite simple, and it is. And software can help us with this, trust me on this. I would recommend the use of a text matching software of which Turnitin is the most famous. But what I would do is make it about you. This is not about a penalty using Turnitin. I would ask you guys to use it as a diagnostic. So put your work through Turnitin as a draft. So click draft and click exclude quotes. That becomes really important. And don't just look at the number. When you get the Turnitin report, print it out and have a look at the text matching that it is finding. Talk about it with your supervisor. You can now, through the transparent changes to our policy, talk about it with your supervisor. Make sure particularly that anything that is being picked up is carefully handled and you make sure that it is referenced well. So do use Turnitin in draft. It's not a punishment. You're using it as a diagnostic. It's another way to improve your information literacy. Remember, our job is to care for you. I want this doctoral program to be the best experience of your life. I want you to learn things. I want you to have a great sense that you go into the world understanding what research is internationally, that you are a professional scholar. I also want to make sure that you are completely supported in terms of the development of academic integrity. So next week, it's the scary one. We're going to focus on plagiarism and your PhD, and we're going to look at the risks, the complexity, and how to avoid it. But I hope you've enjoyed this first week. Thank you again, Jess, for the suggestion as we've looked at the definition of academic integrity and how it applies to you. As always, get in touch with me. I love to hear from you. Anything you'd like to talk about here that maybe you find uncomfortable or you need a bit more information on, just send me a message. I am here for you. As always, I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.